Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. With me today is number one fan, Michael Kester. <laughs> of, what? <laughs> of what? Be I careful. It doesn't even matter. And uh, we're doing two Ayn Rand films on the show today. Yeah, right. What are we... We're going to do uh, two Stephen King films. No. Sorry. Uh, we got the King of the Swing today. Uh, we're going to do Misery and Christine. I just want to... I, I, all right. Spoilers and chapters, right? We're going to spoil the Stephen King book, movie, things. And we are going... There's chapters in the show. Has anyone seen one of these movies and not the other? You've seen Potentially, both of them, right? I've it's seen It's Christine both of them. and Misery. Yeah, I mean, these are, are pretty, pretty classic yeah. films. Uh, I guess if you haven't seen them, we're going to do Misery first, only because that's how I wrote it down in my notes. And you and I just spent the last, I would say, six hours fucking with the input levels on mm-hmm. our uh, little doodad over here. So I don't actually remember anything from these films. Yeah. So if we do... If I have to look at my notes out of order, this is going to be a terrible We got show. a weird cock machine today. cock That's what I was building up to. All right. Here's what I want to get off my chest. I talked about it last episode. I decided that I was going to read some Stephen King for the show today mm-hmm. because I like to try and be at least informed. It is the very least I can do for the show is try to be informed. Right. For I, me, it's show up. For I, yeah, you, it's be informed. I suppose that's not actually the least. I, I shouldn't say that because then- when a show like this happens, you say, how did this happen? Because it's below the least you could do. So we see somebody's movies, John Carpenter, for instance. Right. And I go on a little personal John Carpenter marathon. I want to understand John Carpenter before I try and talk to people about John Carpenter. So I thought, all right, well, we're going to switch things up a little bit. You and I have been talking about Stephen King all fucking year. Yeah. He just shows up on every fucking episode. So it has come time to actually give Stephen King an episode and talk about, well, what the hell is this Stephen King stuff for people like, you know, the Eric of one week ago that did not understand Stephen King. Uh huh. So uh, I got a hold of a ton of Stephen King books. Uh huh. I said, I'm going to do the film thing where I just read them all. Right. And I opened one and it was 1500 pages. So that was one you recommended to me. Yeah. You told me to get The Stand. Right. I figured uh, The Stand is the quintessential sure, sure. Stephen King So I got film. The Stand, and it was 1,500 pages. Yep. And I said, one. fuck that. I'm not going to do that. So I got a couple more, uh, you know, well-known, very well-received Stephen King books, a 1,400 here, a 1,600 here. And I said, you know what? I don't have time for this for the show. So then I got a hold of Misery. I figure, well, you know what? Maybe at the very least, I'll have some additional perspective for the episode we're doing. And uh, Misery, I believe, is still 1,300 pages. It's a long one. Now, none of that is an excuse, right? Because, because I, when I, books are long. I got 14 pages in. So yeah. it doesn't matter if the book is 200 pages or 1,500 pages. Here's the problem. And this is you know, why I mentioned Ayn Rand. I really like Atlas Shrugged. It's a long book. It's very political. It's kind of philosophical. It's really thick. It's, uh, it's kind of a political monologue done in the form it's like it's disguised as having characters yeah absolutely oh hey we're secretly doing... disguised yeah right uh but it's just actually a bunch of political ideas and very great and i i love reading that thing but anytime i pick up another book and it's 1500 pages there is a very real part of me i would like to cop to right now that says uh you could just be reading atlas shrugged again sure and then i can't do it i well, just and then, can't and there's always the uh the so a lot of people will say and and this is a great form to talk about it we have this thing uh, sleepynaptimeshow.com bookshow.doublefeatureshow.com you can go download these books you can listen to the audio version that's great if you don't want to sit and hold fucking trees in your hand right. and smell the scent of dead life oh man I even had the iPad going I had some digital books uh, I went out of my way to actually buy these things that didn't even so it wasn't the smell of dead trees okay, that was turning well, me off. If you're not into listening to the audiobook, which you can totally do for free, and it's great if you do that, if you go to bookshow.doublefeatureshow.com, sure. we get a little dough out of that. You don't have to pay anything. It's great. If you're not into that, there's this other thing that people have been doing with movies since I don't know, uh nineteen thirty. <laughs> yeah. Called making the fucking movie. Yeah. Which is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the fucking movie. That came out of two of Stephen King's novels, Misery and Christine. Now, uh, what I have been doing is I tried to get through Misery. Uh, I've been talking to everyone I know that's read any Stephen King. I've been talking to all these people. I've been reading Stephen King biographies. I've been trying to do my homework without actually doing my homework. 
So we're going to learn something about Mr. Stephen yeah, King we are. today. From two filmmakers where you wouldn't really expect to learn about Stephen King yeah, from these guys. Yeah, very true. So I guess we're starting with Misery first because that's what my fucking notepad over here says. All right, we got a couple names here. Mm-hmm. We got Barry Sonnenfeld. Okay, right? that's Adam's family. Cinematographer for Misery mm-hmm. and somebody whose work we are clearly going to be talking about here. Yes. Uh, we also have Mark Shaman. Yes. Once again, who we talked about in The Adams, Adam's family, family, who did Team America, who did uh, some stuff for South Park, including the movie. So some familiar names uh, put together this, this mastery, this great piece of work called Misery, uh, along with Rob Reiner. Anyways... Um, should we talk, we should talk about Rob Reiner. Okay. A bit. So Rob Reiner is, uh, he's a filmmaker. If you're not familiar. That was the most you could give me out of the voice. Sorry. I, I was trying not to make it too obnoxious in the beginning because it's going to get more annoying oh, as it goes all right, on. All right. All right. He's a filmmaker. You may re- remember him from South Park as eating a hamburger. Right. Um, South Park makes fun of him. <laughs> to, to no end does South Park make fun of him. My impression of, of Rob Reiner that one was a little British that time. I'm sorry. Huh? That had some lifestyles of the rich and famous in there. Oh, yeah. South Park, man. South Park has tainted me to dislike this guy. And maybe that's a lot of it. But I really liked him in All in the Family. All in the Family right. is a great racist sitcom from the 60s. And if you dig that, I, I highly recommend <laughs> sure. watching All in the Family. That's where Rob Reiner is his absolute best. But so he directs Misery, and maybe he brings stuff to the table. You and I were, were watching it, and we loved the film. Yeah, right. We loved the film, so we're not knocking him as a filmmaker, at least in Misery. But I feel like for this film, I feel like a lot of it came from Barry Sonnenfeld, and right. a lot of it came from Kathy Bates. Yeah, well, you know, I'm watching this, and I think we should give Rob some credit. I mean, some of the shots are really, I was going to say some of the shots are really interesting, but I, that's probably Barry Sonnenfeld, right? So I'm not really sure where Rob Reiner's hand in this is. Uh, I'm not going to say that I don't. I don't have his films in front of me, so mm-hmm. I couldn't tell you if I love or hate them or whatever. But I know the guy has some really wacky anti-smoking views. It's one of the. It's sort of the Tom Cruise thing that happens, where you can enjoy all these films for decades, and then all of a sudden the person does one stupid, jump very on public couch. thing. Yeah. So Rob Reiner had his jump on the couch moment when he started doing all this weird activism. Not something that I should really. I mean, a guy who's a filmmaker also happens to be an activist. I don't know why that rubs me the wrong way. But uh, every time you make your stupid Rob Reiner voice, I giggle a little bit. So, all right. So, maybe it's Barry Sonnenfeld. Maybe it's Rob Reiner. Clearly, it's most likely the connection. the The both of them working together. You know, there's that scene early on where the camera is following the sheriff. It's when he's investigating Mm -hmm. the, uh, the car crash. And it kind of follows him back up. He gets in his car or whatever. Camera immediately moves to the left and gets caught on Annie's car and just travels with her. The kind of thing that, um, you know, every once in a while we talk about things movies didn't have to do. Uh They're just showing. Death to Smoochie was a movie that showed off all the time. Coraline, too. Yeah, Coraline as well. And it's just one of those things where you don't have to move from a shot of, you know, him getting in his car to a fast-moving shot of her car on the other side of the frame. Just little stuff like that that's really showy, but doesn't stand out from the film as... I guess as obnoxious as what it would be if it stood out. Uh, not, hey, over here, look at me, lots of style going on. Still totally fits in. Just one of those tricks that if you you kind of look at what they're doing, you realize it was a lot of work, and probably four people noticed it. Mm-hmm. So good that we bring attention to that Yeah, here. there we go. So we get the Stephen King really strong here. Yeah. People love the idea of Stephen King as a writer. And I mean, Paul Sheldon is Stephen King. Yeah. Stephen King writes about writers all the fucking time. We talked about that. Fuck, we talked about it back even on uh, Bright Falls, Mm -hmm. you know, about Alan Wake being about a writer. But then again, on The Shining, a uh, movie about a book about a writer, um, it seems like it must be a third of his books are about writers. Stephen King's kind of got this. There's this early thing when you when you learn to write. I took a few writing classes a while ago. And a lot of what you first hear when you learn to write, you hear, write what you know. Yeah. And Stephen King, I think, took that far too much to heart. <laughs> right. And he goes, I'm a writer. I know how to write sure. books questionable. And so all my characters will be writers, too, because yeah. I can identify with them. And therefore, I can bring them a fullness of character by pouring myself into them, which usually is not the way to go. <laughs> it's funny. That's the antithesis of what we're doing with the show today. You know, Stephen King, write what you know, double feature, cover what you have no fucking clue what you're talking about. That seems to be what we're doing with today's episode. Fuck, that's what we're doing next time, too. Yeah. 
But it almost seems to me that Stephen King is one of those guys. I don't want to make a personal judgment about the guy because I've never fucking met him. What do I know? But uh, the type of person who likes to live a lifestyle that he believes people think he should be living. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, okay, so look at Paul Sheldon, right? He goes to a remote cabin hotel to work, like you would imagine a writer doing. Sure. Um, I know you and I both work with music stuff, so maybe this will, at least to you, but this won't make sense for anyone else. But it's kind of like uh, the uninitiated might think of a record is recorded by a band that all goes in the studio plays their song and then they walk out and they have a recording when as you know most uh most often in almost every fucking case like remove the outliers every single case what happens is you record one person at a time you yep. record a million takes well what and happens you tediously is, go over them and meld them into a song if, then that's the easy way sometimes you go and record everybody and then that's kind of that's your fucking canvas, and then you yes. record over everything you already sure, recorded. Sure, sure, sure. And then you record over that some more. So uh, when you look at Paul Sheldon as a writer, he writes the way that people think of writers writing. Right. But when you, you stop, if you've ever written anything yourself, I mean, even if, uh, maybe people forget this after school, but if I'm going to write something, first thing I do is an outline. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, not the first thing Stephen King does, but certainly most writers start with a concept and they fill it in a little bit and more and more until they kind of have something they can do their whole manuscript with. But not only does he go to this remote cabin to work and he sits down at his typewriter and he starts typing until he finishes the story, but he's got these rituals too. I guess it's kind of romanticizing what a writer does. It yeah. doesn't deal with any of the nitty gritty stuff. It doesn't deal with trying to come up with characters and a million crumpled pieces of paper mm-hmm. as you throw out idea after idea it's just sit down, write, very clean, no mess. Because otherwise, that's not romantic. Right. And we like to think of our writers as the same way we like to think of our rock stars. Sure, but also Paul Sheldon's character has to have, he has to be a romantic writer. Otherwise, Annie would never be attracted to him. So you think that's not so much talking about Stephen King? Oh, Maybe no, some of that. I'm but... not saying, I'm saying that that is 100% talking <laughs> okay. about Stephen King. I'm saying it works in misery because. Yeah, right, right. Annie's character needs to fall in love with this methodical Sure. Very. She keeps using the word brilliant. Yeah. I would use the word ritualistic. Perhaps. Exactly. This guy who who lives the writer persona, the public persona of yeah. a famed writer. Yeah. That's what she falls in love with. Well, because he has in... to be a famous writer. Exactly. Too. And that's what she falls in love with. That's what attracts her to him. Is that yeah. he's got these rituals, and she's a very religious person. So you can translate his rituals sure. to a sure. religious kind of practice. And plus, it's easy to memorize. It's easy to become acquainted with him without ever meeting him, as long as you know what he does and how he is. Well, it's good to recite, too. It works for the story. It also helps us uh, show how much knowledge she has about, you know, the the thing a number one fan would know. The thing, uh, not to keep going back to music, but, you know, you went through high school and you knew your favorite band. You knew where they were from. You knew where the singer was born. You knew which member of your of your fucking class babysat their kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're from Chicago, maybe. So Paul is a guy who you know finishes his manuscript and he has a single cigarette, which of course there's an anecdote behind. And there's the one cigarette and the one match on the table, very iconic. Always orders champagne. Always writes in the same place. But the other thing this might tell us about Stephen King, and perhaps a defense of uh, what at least I've heard to be his most criticized. He writes the same book over Mm -hmm. and over. Everyone that I've spoken to has told me this. A lot of people enjoy that kind of... um, Home base. They like looking at these books as surface. They're fast books. You can read through them. They're pulpy. Yeah, exactly the word I'm looking for, pulpy. But then if you look at Paul's career and you want to read into that, or Stephen King, is he the one who is trapped writing misery over and over? Because when he branches out, no one buys the books, universally hated... They want to bring, he thinks that, you know, you see uh, Paul's reactions, even with his agent, he doesn't like misery. Mm -hmm. He kind of has a spot for misery in that it's a franchise he created. Isn't that interesting? Maybe when we talk about uh, even somebody like John Carpenter, Mm -hmm. who tried to branch out of Halloween when he did Halloween three or, you know, more of a production role in that. But you understand what I'm saying. I do. Trying to get away from the same thing. But people want to see Michael Myers. They want to see him return to the same familiar places, same familiar characters. Do you think it's possible that, I mean, Stephen King's written a lot, and in his body of work, there certainly are especially short stories Mm -hmm. that don't fall into the same formula. Do you think he's kind of a victim of his success? I think that anybody can argue, yeah. Stephen King has unfortunately been 
been i guess you can't typecast a writer um, <laughs> sure. i guess you can but in a different sense of typing he's forced i guess to make these these horror stories right but with a man with his kind of pull his kind of success and the money i'm sure he's banking on every single one of his fucking books as a movie come on yeah why does he stick with it there's no reason other than to have a continued commercial success. Sure. Which, if it's really bothering him, he should be able to break away from. He right. should be comfortable right. breaking away from it. I think he's, I think he's okay. Yeah. I think he's okay being the scary story guy. Yeah, and I mean, if you, uh, if you write those, if that's what comes natural to you, you feel like you have a talent for it, you're certainly successful. And, you know, developing franchises sort of sounds like something that's fun. It kind of sounds like after you do a few of those, you start to see the feedback. If you write a book and nobody likes it, who are you going to talk to your book about? Right. I mean, we talked about uh, the Anne Rice stuff before, the whole interview with the vampire, the Vampire Chronicles. Later did borderline, I guess it was overtly religious stuff. Yeah. And a lot of the people who liked the vampire stuff hated it. So as Anne Rice, what do you do? You get really sad that no one likes your new stuff. You can't read what people are saying. That's why you write stuff. You put it out there, see what people have to say about it. You know, that's part of creating any piece of art, I guess is once it's on display, how do other how do other people evaluate right. that? You know, how does it speak to them? Well, but in Misery, there is no backlash of the audience. The audience never says, your new material is shit. The only one that says that is this fucking psychotic... Yeah, Annie. Annie, who... I mean, her opinion is, for all intents and purposes, if that's your number one fan, it, you're, that's not the opinion you give a shit about. Yeah, and Annie, what a fucking character that is. So, Kathy Bates absolutely breathes subtlety into what's otherwise an obvious character. Let me give you my book report from the 13 pages I read of Misery. Uh, this is a character who, right from the get-go, is obviously an antagonist. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is uh, making Paul drink you know, water out of dish buckets. And you know, just uh, pain. There's obvious pain. There's obvious oppression there right away. With the performance given by Kathy Bates, you absolutely believe when she starts being a kind person again, uh, and then she goes back to being a psychopath, and you say to yourself, well, wait a second, she was, I should know that she's a psychopath, I just forgot about that. I tell myself over and over, she's just having a bad day. Sure. Every time she has a little, she's on she her lashes rag. out, <laughs> she lashes out, and I say, well, clearly something just went, went wrong for her today, she's not a bad person. Even when I learn that she's a fucking baby killer. Right. I'm still thinking, a uh, nice person under there somewhere, right? Well, if you're going to go with Stephen King, your goal is to always go menstrual blood. And is that... Maybe she's just on her period. Oh, I forgot about that. So there is a moment where we find out, and I love this so much, that she... We, first, we get the piece of knowledge that in Misery's Child, the fictional book, in the fictional Stephen King book that he's written, uh, Misery's Child is a book in which the titular character everyone loves, especially Annie, dies. She dies at the end. She dies of childbirth. Right. And then uh, we find out, you know, once we're introduced to this character, she says, oh, yeah, I love all, I think it's eight of the misery mm -hmm. books. Um, the new one is apparently just coming out. She hasn't read it yet. And the second that she says she hasn't read it, or when she brings it back, when mm -hmm. she brings it back to the house and says, oh, look what I've got. I got the first fucking copy that came out. I can't wait to read it. Immediately, my mind goes back to... Just a brief 20 minutes ago when we find out that Misery dies, and I just think, oh, shit. That's right. just one of the biggest gut-dropping kind of moments I can remember having in recent memory where you just know there's going to be some serious fallout there. Sure, and James Caan shows it, too. I mean, yeah. Paul yeah. is in the bed. She's holding the book like it's the fucking yep. gospel, yep. and he's staring at it going, God, how long do I have before she <laughs> yes. finishes that yep. thing? They're having conversations throughout her reading it, sure. and he gets to the point where she's like, I, I have to go finish it. I have to go finish it, and he falls asleep that night and wakes up to a very furious yeah. Annie Wilkes. I am, uh, I'm a little disappointed in Paul's, what he has to offer her at that point. So you're a writer, Mr. Writer, great storyteller. You're supposed to be good at coming up with stories, right? Um, so for somebody who has so much creativity to them, uh, as we're led to believe, the best he has when she comes in the room is, no, 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 it's a transference of life. Right. He knows that she's married to this character, and he couldn't think of anything better to save his life because I would go into survival mode immediately. I would go into ass saving mode. What am I going to tell her to make? I would go with retcon, which sure. we get to later. That's eventually right. what happens. But I'm trying to think of, oh, not really dead. 
Maybe you didn't right. understand the metaphor. Something to save your sure. ass. Well, unless you're Rob Zombie, right? In which case you go, <laughs> no, seriously, he got shot in the fucking face at point blank range. And then the studio yeah. hobbles your ankles, yes. ties you to a wheelchair and says, write me the sequel. Sure. Rob Zombie fans, meaning just us and Rob Zombie, who are listening to this should go back through Misery and just imagine that it's Rob Zombie. Doing the Halloween the, sequel. Yeah, in the hospital bed under Dimensions rule. Kathy Bates would play a great dimension, too. Absolutely. So we've learned about uh, her personal attachment to that character. She gets closer and closer to the end of the book. And we're also getting these brief periods where you don't have a whole lot of background for her. You're getting to know her a little bit. She's getting a little bit more violence. Um, during these episodes of violence, sometimes the, the way they frame those shots and just the look she's giving, it's, uh, it's a, little, a little bit underneath and from the side. And the camera is always under her. Mm -hmm. I mean, when she is angry, sure. she is, you get that perspective as if you're laying in the bed and uh -huh. she's hovering over you. And you're absolutely at her fucking mercy. She could bludgeon you to death. She could stab you in the face. She could, well, she breaks your fucking ankles. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's about as bad as, that's one of the worst case scenarios at that point. Torture over death. Right. So you're Paul Sheldon, right? You wake up from this accident, number one fan, and then you start to get this inkling that she might be a violent, deranged, crazy person. A little bit redundant there. Uh, what do you do when you first wake up? I mean, are you asking her stuff? Are you trying to figure out where you are? How do you get through a situation like that? I think you just have to try and prepare for the worst right off the bat. Yeah? He does He does that, at least that much, where he, he stops taking the medicine, right? Right. He doesn't even know what the medicine is, but he stops taking it. Can't possibly be good. Probably a sedative of some kind. Sure. Maybe poison. He doesn't know she's a crazy person. But the problem is you can't drive anywhere. You can't call anyone. You're essentially stuck there. The best you can do is, is try to use her against herself. Yeah. Which she eventually starts to do. Yeah, and that's something I like about the story a lot, too, is that in uh, any other story, your heroes have to be heroic. It's very rarely in, you know, even in the situations that we see with... Um, a movie like P2 or anything where you're, you're taken hostage. People's lives are on the line, but they still have some sense of personal honor. He is going for desperation. He is just going broke for it. He falls in love with her. He get, convinces her to help write the novel. This is a character I can identify with. Mm -hmm. If I'm put in that scenario, I don't spit in their face. Sure. I don't tell them to go fuck themselves. I try to play whatever game I can to get out of that hospital bed and, you know, and keep my life intact. Dignity, not important to me. Being alive, very important. So he plays her game. He has fucking dinner with her. He uh, does everything he can to make it look like he doesn't understand that she's deranged, mm -hmm. as if that doesn't get to him. And every time he finds out a little bit more details about her, they get even worse. We find out early on that she lives alone. I mean, that's an important detail. Uh, she has a pig. Right. Mm -hmm. So they talk a little bit about, you know, her. She used to have a husband, maybe. Right. She had some kind of There's court a thing weird that conversation happened. about yeah. marriage where that's the, that's a doubly awkward scene because you find out that she used to be married. And there's also the looming her falling in love with Paul, which is very uncomfortable because I think the last time you see her before she kind of says talks about this marriage thing is when she's snorting and running in circles and then runs out of <laughs> yeah. the room. Yeah, even when she's happy, she's fucking crazy. That's another thing. I mean, I can't say enough good things about Kathy Bates uh, in this performance. She is, you know, she's great at being evil, but I almost like seeing her more happy. You know, when she comes home with that book, I think she's just as crazy in a completely different sure. way. You see how much that... It's like a, a fucking 12-year-old girl bringing home whatever Pulp Fiction thing is relevant at the time the show goes up. You know, one of these books that you stand in line at midnight to go get, and you come home with a thing clutched to your chest, and you hang out with your favorite characters. Mm -hmm. uh, you believe that she's in that 12-year-old girl yeah. mentality. She manages to stay crazy whether she's being a good guy or a bad guy. She yeah, is for sure. 100% nuts 100% of the time. Yeah, right. And it's hard to beat how nuts she is when she finally gets a misery book. You know, that shows us how important that is. Even when she is smashing his feet with a fucking, what is that, a sledgehammer? Yeah. Even then, I still think, well, you know, she liked that book a lot, too. That makes her pretty fucking crazy. So she also has this incredible moment in uh, where she's basically doing our show is what's happening. Right. 
So when she finds out Misery dies, Mm -hmm. she essentially forces Paul to write the ninth book. I had a brief conversation where I told you that if this situation were to arise and then the crazy person were to kill themselves and the writer, all nine of those books will become the best-selling books of all time for eternity. You want to talk about legacy. If that is your concern, you go down in flames, my friend. But she forces him to write the book where Misery turns out isn't dead. The first version, she reads and says that it's shit, and she goes into this story about how she used to go to see the chapter plays when she was a little girl. Right. And her favorite, right? Her favorite was Rocket Man, and there's a there's there was one of the one of the chapters where he goes flying off the cliff in a car, Mm -hmm. and then the next week they show you know the end of the previous weeks in which they show again this car about to barrel off the cliff. However, Rocket Man leaps out just (laughs) in time to survive the fall, and all the kids cheered. But she was not cheering. No. No, because she had been there that night at Halloween, which fucking, we probably shouldn't spoil that, right? One of the Halloween movies has an eerily similar ending of, uh, I don't even remember if it's the ending, of someone, perhaps the lead character, jumping off just before something ridiculous happens. Um, so this is a type of retcon, and we deal with two different types of retcons here, and she, she really expresses that she doesn't like this type of retcon. I don't even have a name for this because I hate it so much, but let's just call it the cheap kind of retcon. The, uh, you know what, the soap opera retcon, Uh where a woman walks in and sees her fiance making out with some chick, and then, you know, her her face, she has this expression of terror, and then they cut to commercial, come back, she walks in again, everybody's just hanging out, having a good time. You're supposed to believe that that never even fucking happened. And it's the cheapest kind of retcon because there's no creativity to it. There's no, I mean, at least with, so what's the retcon he ends up giving her? Essentially, it has something to do with her being in a coma due to a bee sting that proves that she's, uh, she's royal lineage and that's a big deal. I mean, so if you're throwing something great at your audience along with coma bee sting, maybe that's that's something to turn that right around, didn't he? So there's another Stephen King element that that kind of takes place, and it's one of my favorite Stephen King elements. A while ago we did, if you you go on our website and find all the Stephen King movies we did, doublefeatureshow.com. I believe that's half the movies we've ever done at this point. One of those films, I go into exquisite detail about how much I love Stephen King killing the Ahab. Yes. Now... Again, we could go into questionable territory about whether this is an Ahab. We had a conversation about whether primates can be Ahabs earlier on in our show (laughs) as well. In a movie about bees, I believe. In this film, it's arguable that Buster may be the Ahab. Annie is clearly a serial killer. She has killed many people. Right. We just don't see her killing, so it's a little less slasher But he's learned all the information, and he's out to get her. He knows she's the villain. And there's this brilliant thing where he finally puts all the pieces together, finds the man he's been looking for, and gets his fucking heart blown out through his chest with a double-barreled shotgun. And I love that because I really like to see the Ahab go through pains to, to save the day and fail. Because in all honesty, sometimes that's what happens. Yeah, right. And sometimes your lead character has to fucking fend for themselves. Yep. And if there's one man out there, Mr. Stephen King, writing stories where that happens all the time, it helps counterbalance all of those other people who come to the rescue. And, you know, I'm absolutely fine with that, too. I understand the Stephen King thing of, you know, people have to overcome their own personal conflicts and they can't always use the help of another person. And then there's also that. Uh, again, the slasher mentality part of me that just like seeing the person who we thought was going to ride in on the white horse completely blown away. And the characters are once again, just as fucked as before. So a few blunt objects later, we are now into Christine. We've got a 1958 Plymouth Fury, but this is not road exploitation as we're used to seeing it. No, not really. Unfortunately, uh, a movie that I don't even know necessarily has any inspiration from road exploitation. Although when you think about car movies, Christine is one that a lot of people, it's the, sure. for a lot of people, it's the first that comes to sure. mind. So in our lineup of old classic, have you ever been in Illinois? Uh, we're doing this out of Chicago, if I didn't make an obscure Chicago reference yet. Did we hit one? Yeah, we show? already got it. We're covered. All right. So have you been to the Volvo Museum? I um, have. The one at, where is that? McHenry or somewhere kind of out there? Yeah, it's far west. So did you see the Christine car there? No. Because they apparently have, I don't know if this is a new thing or not, but someone was just telling me about this. They have one of the remaining models still there in a probably pretty shiny new condition. Sure. If anyone lives in this area, go there and take a picture of that. Naked. And send that. Yeah. 
with yourself naked uh, near the car, they probably won't let you in the car, especially if you're naked. They might not even allow you on the premises. So perhaps a photo of you naked and a photo of the car, and I will put them both together in Photoshop and, and send them back to you. And you can make it your Facebook profile picture. That would be excellent. So unlike probably every other John Carpenter movie we've ever seen on the show, yeah. this opens with a teaser. Yeah. We get an insight into what the killing may be like later on in the movie. Mm -hmm. I can't think, I know you've seen a couple more of the John Carpenter films than I have, but I can't think of anything where you get a tease of the monster in the very beginning. You really don't. And John Carpenter, as we touched on really heavily in The Fog and, mm -hmm. and in the past, we've done plenty of John Carpenter. The thing about John Carpenter is he's not known for teasing. He's known for pacing. Yes. and Someone some, call it teasing. Yeah. Uh, he's known for a lot of stuff not happening in the first half, which, by the way, it sounds like I'm ragging on that. I do not mind that oh, at no. all. I, I totally I, love it. Sometimes in some of the movies like The Fog, I enjoy the buildup more than the payoff. I love John Carpenter to no end. But I think that Christine, it has this weird introduction where it shows it shows Christine getting made in the 50s. Yeah. And then she kills off two people, or she hurts right. a guy, kills a guy. And then immediately we're thrust into the 70s, into real bullshit Stephen King <laughs> high school, shitty dialogue, shitty action, right. shitty everything. What are we doing here? For a very long time. And it's not until Christine really starts doing some John Carpenter stuff that I see John Carpenter come back into the film a lot of it seems like him just trying to survive the bullshit setup right. that Stephen King As and the screenplay writer yeah. have kind of put on this this poor film. I love that you anthropomorphize the car. You continue doing that, and I'm going to continue talking about it as if it were an actual car, and we'll get some balance to the show. Uh, I actually think this is a pretty great mechanism for John Carpenter. In a lot of movies, I don't like this, but I think it's incredibly effective in Christine. Um, you know, people keep telling us through the whole movie that bad things will happen, that they're going to happen. The guy who's fucking selling the car, you know, mm -hmm. his brother died in it. The car garage guy uh, tells him about, oh, you know, I, I knew a guy who used to have a car like that, committed suicide or whatever. Sure. It just seems eventually when they return to the salesman, he's giving them a flat out fucking list of people this car has killed. So through the whole movie, it's saying the car, it's going to be a bad place. It's a source of darkness. Evil dwells here. And we just don't see it at mm -hmm. all. It's just, uh, we're going to assemble the car. It's too pretty. I have shitty parents. You know, right. We're dealing with other... Well, we should talk about the high school thing a little yeah. bit. I think your big beef with this is that this high school does not exist. Right? I hate Stephen King doing high school. Mm -hmm. If you go back, our most recent Music Box Massacre coverage, not Music Box 6, which we actually had in Chicago this year, right? but Music Box 5, which we put up Talked about. in sure. October... Carrie is the final film. Yeah, right. I hate Stephen King doing high school. Right. If Carrie Probably why you didn't stay for Carrie. Yeah. If Carrie weren't bad enough, yeah. Christine, I think, is the worst. Really? I feel like Stephen King never went to high school. If I, if I wiki Stephen King, which I won't do, I would not be surprised to find out he was homeschooled. It's, it's like he watched Saved by the Bell right. and went, okay, this is a little bit too realistic, so I'm going to stylize it a bit. There's nerds who can't get their lockers open. There's a single jock in the entire school who all the girls are crazy over. Sure. And then there's the bully who has not managed to graduate for the past 25 years. Right, yeah. Who's beating people up for no reason, pulling knives in Well, yeah, it's class. very unrealistic. Uh, for two people who hang out in Chicago, it's even uh, pretty unrealistic. Even when you go back to Carrie, I think uh, I'm going to totally agree with you on that. Carrie is a way more realistic portrayal of, you know, the, even the stuff in Carrie that's unrealistic. I go, well, the story is about high school life. You have to understand that all of these people are picking on her. Otherwise, the payoff does nothing except is humorous. But even real John Travolta, not the fake John Travolta in this movie, but real Carrie John Travolta did not pull a knife. So whatever. Somebody pulls a knife at the high school. Everybody's picking on him. They're the antagonists. He has nerdy glasses, moving right along. Past the shitty parents, moving right along. Can we talk about the death curse car salesman? If you if you have a keen eye for character actors, which Eric hates that I have. <laughs> yeah, because I don't understand that you go, that guy, and I just don't know what you're talking so, about. I don't know the guy's name. A lot of times I don't know the guy's name, but I'll point at them and I'll go, how familiar are you with... In this case, I say Home Alone. Eric goes, I haven't seen Home Alone since before I remember. And I say, that was the, the salt shoveling neighbor. <laughs> right. So this guy- You also have to understand in this, uh, this anecdote of yours, 
that before I remember is actually a, a chunk of my life. Right. There's a point at which I no longer remember things. Home Alone, one of the four movies I saw before that point. So this guy, he's got a back brace and a death curse. That's all this guy brings yeah. to the party. He sells the car for... Don't go in that their car. There's a death curse. Exactly. He sells the car at a markdown price to Arnie, who's a sucker of yeah. a kid. And despite pleading from his benevolent jock friend, he sells him the car knowing that it's bad news and then says, don't come back looking for me. Right. I'm selling my house and buying me a condominium. Okay. So 150 things I like about this scene. Number one, in Stephen King's unrealistic portrayal of high school... Every geeky kid has one super cool jock friend because that's what happens. Number two is that this is an expensive, fancy car, which is given a discount because of a death curse. Uh This is a death (laughs) curse discount. This car, it's about, uh, you know, $2,000 minus death curse. I'll give it to you for 300 bucks. I would buy any death cursed car, any vehicle I would buy for $300 if you told me there's a death curse. The Amityville house sold, I think, last year for a million and a half. I you just, could have capital. You were a million and a half short, is I think what happened damn. there. So death curse discount. But then he's going to sell his woodsy log cabin, whatever's uh-huh. going on back there, for one of them their condominiums. I mean, it does not get much better than a scene like this. All right, I'm going to throw another one at you. How Great. about Stephen King and subtlety? Stephen King and subtlety shouldn't go in the same. <laughs> there, sentence. Is, there isn't a whole lot. However, from now on, I would like to refer to films who have an overt lack of subtlety. As being the king of subtlety. <laughs> right. I mean that in every sense. How about when it not only has a lack of subtlety, how about specifically when a character explains the metaphor yeah, within absolutely. the film itself? So this is strange because we're we're watching a John Carpenter film. Yeah. John Carpenter is truly, and without making fun of it, the king of subtlety. Yeah. Things that happen in John Carpenter films, you don't understand why they're happening. Especially, I mean, come on, 70s, 80s horror yeah. director with that score. Look at The Thing. The yeah. Thing is a great example of yeah. subtlety. It's it's fantastic. Christine, even with... <laughs> with the jo- Carpenter pull. With John Carpenter at the helm, Stephen King's disgusting lack of subtlety and complete disregard for the audience's intelligence just bleeds into this poor film. So what I um, what I told you before the show is that I was going to have some kind of opinion for you after having read some Stephen King. And I don't. But here's here's my handle on this. I'm going to kind of defend him for this, although I don't know if I actually should. This is going to sound like when uh, films do dumb things and I call them experimental films. It's going to sound like that a little bit. All right. So in this movie, a couple examples really quick. Uh, Arnie says, for the first time in my life, I found something uglier than me. He's describing his attraction to this car. Uh, there's another even worse one where he says, you know, he's talking about his shitty parents, his Stephen King shitty parents. And he says, they don't want me to grow up. And you go, okay, they're really handing us the metaphor here. We already know that they don't want him to grow up, but now he's really making sure we know. And then tops that off with, because then they have to face how fucking old they're getting. So these are not only themselves metaphors that are pretty fucking obvious and pointed to you with a big red arrow. But if you don't understand what a metaphor is, a character will step out and say, here is what this means. Uh, this happens over here, and as a result, these things over here are happening. Right. My parents don't like this because they're fucking old. All right, so for people like you and I that, um, let's say, painfully dissect films uh-huh. on the show, sometimes, uh, almost always, far more than films ever need yeah. to be talked about or dissected because that's just what we fucking do around here. Those seem really obvious to us. Mm-hmm. But if you're writing pulp novels, if you look at this in the context of, uh, let's just label Stephen King as guy who writes pulp stuff, right? I think the fact that there's someone out there teaching people English 101 what a metaphor is, I think that's kind of cool. And I think that's probably why a lot of people read his stuff. I feel like it's upsetting because of how well the books sell comparatively to say something, <laughs> well, yeah. say something like The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrug. Stephen King outsells like you're trying both to appeal of them. I am. Me. No one Stephen else. Stephen King outsells both of them combined right. annually with <laughs> one novel. Pick a novel. He's outselling it. Yeah, so you don't like the sales. Is that you don't like that it's that successful. Man, lowest common denominator. I'm I sorry know. to continually bring it up, but that shit's been well, great. That's on me the lately. way I feel about I was hoping we could go through a whole show about literature without me doing this. But uh, you know, Twilight I can pick on and no one will we'll, we won't get one angry email because even people who read Twilight understand that there is a uh, a popular conception that it's dumb. Mm-hmm. But I will also say this to people about Harry Potter books. And before you start writing me nasty emails, 
I love the third Harry Potter. Some of the movies are cool. Whatever. The fifth book changed my life. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. That was the last one I uh, I bought without reading. That's That was my life changing. I stopped reading Harry Potter. All right. But do you understand what I mean about there's a million books at the bookstore? Mm-hmm. They don't all have to be as thick and heavy-handed as Atlas Shrugged. Sure. Uh, there could be books. Like, I really enjoy 1984. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of books out there, yeah, it turns sure. out. Read oh, some Kurt some Vonnegut, say, read some Oscar Wilde. Some would say hundreds of thousands of books, maybe even millions of books in existence Have you been to today. a library? You know, libraries are full of these things. But there's something that burns inside me that just says, Harry Potter, adults, come on. If you're in high school and you're reading Harry Potter, it doesn't bother me at all. Maybe even college, I'll excuse it. But I know fucking adults, that's all that they read. And man, do they pat themselves on the back. Hey, I read. Look at what I'm... You know, look I, how big this Harry Potter book is. Yeah, right. And that's how the Stephen King books are too. If it was a gateway, I would be so cool with that. But if that's all you're going to read, I just feel sad for those people because they're missing out on so Absolutely. much. Coming from the guy who just said he won't read anything more than 1500 uh-huh. pages that isn't the fucking fountainhead, you're missing out on so much. Just read if you're going to read, don't just read what everybody's telling you to read. Read what seems more interesting. Or well, don't I'm read it all. Branch out. Don't <laughs> read don't. it all. I like how you're encouraging that. It's it's illiteracy or death for you on the well, show. Well, I'm just saying people don't need to fucking read. We're doing a film podcast. <laughs> we c- neither of us have read right. either of these books. Yes. Who are we to go? You guys need to go to your local library right. and get a all fucking right, right. library. No, what you need to do is watch more John Carpenter movies and and more Kathy Bates movies. That's what we should be saying. We have no right. Really to tell respecting you to read. the bread and butter of our show, though, I'm Michael. Just, I appreciate I'm that. I'm just trying to, to. We have stock in films. Maybe our opinion's a little biased. I'm trying to limit our angry emails. So John Carpenter shows up in this film pretty yeah. heavily, and I would say the second half. Yeah, he shows up when Christine starts doing some killing. For me, it's the football scene. That's where you get. It. I think it's oh, the really? score. You know, it's yeah, outside, that's and that's not really John Carpentery, but. Man, that fucking score kicks in, yeah. and that is it for me. Yeah. I really like when, from when Christine rebuilds herself, that scene on. Yeah, I guess that's true, too. when John yeah. Carpenter, I feel, is all over this film. There's the creepy, slow-moving beginning where Christine's parked under the overpass. Right. And she kind of rolls out at her leisure, and then the headlights go on, yeah. and there's a sweet J.J. Abrams before J.J. Abrams lens flare. A horizontal lens flare there. And that whole scene culminates in... Uh, this is this is what I remembered about the film. Uh, from now on, I will remember the towering inferno of Christine. Yes. But the first time I watched the film, and I think the second or third time, the only thing I remember, because it's been a while since I've seen this one, is that Christine wedges herself yeah, into right. that tiny space to right. kill the first guy. Sure. I love that. Right after you realize it has a superpower. Right. Yeah, but then there's also the moment where the car is on fire. Mm-hmm. You ride up to the gas station. There's the fucking flame. I will never forget that moment. Chasing down the kid. It's kind of that Radiohead music sure. video. You've yeah. seen uh, the Karma Police, uh-huh. uh, the video for Karma Police. Just that one scene, I guess, though. But man, the car driving away from the gas station. It's a uh, fireball. Yeah, it's, it's an inferno. A car. Right. It's not a little tiny fireball in the back seat. The entire car is a gigantic ball of fire. I've never seen anything fucking like that. No, it was, it's amazing. It was pretty fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So let's talk about the rules of the car a little bit while you hit on this, uh, the car fixing itself thing. One of the first moments you get where you see Arnie's, uh, what we think is a symbiotic relationship with the car is uh, when they're at, I, they're at the drive-in right? and sure. they're both sitting in there and he gets up to leave to fuck with his car. Cause he loves his car and inside the car, the doors are locked and she starts choking. She doesn't start choking because the seat nailed her in the back or she, she wasn't startled by the radio flipping on and playing old fifties. Right. Music. Uh, air conditioning knob flew down her throat. She just starts choking. Uh, is this ghost power? What's Apparently, psychic car? The car has the car has a little bit of Stephen King in it. Okay, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of in the car. It's the car's rules. Maybe the car was built on an Indian burial ground. I don't know. I haven't read the novel. I'm sure there are Native Americans dead somewhere in it. But, in the trunk, probably is where they would be, or the ashtray. But yeah, the the girl chokes by some mystical power right and there's a blinding light that comes from inside the car how good is that too while you were talking about light stuff usually things are obscured in shadows this time it's obscured by light so much overexposure we don't know what's happening inside the awesome and i think that's really the only 
exceptionally supernatural kill of the entire film. From then on, right. it's straight up car death. You run him over, you run him down. Well, you, know, you, you set have him on the, fire. <laughs> you have the old timey car radio music, uh, which is part of, I guess that's just the car talking though, right? That's fine. In probably the least scary car voice you and I have ever sure. heard Little Richard. on this, yeah, yeah, on this show. Um, a highly effective voice would be the CB radio, perhaps right. that we did way back. What, which? Uh, well, yeah, Joyride when we did Joyride and the Attic Expeditions. But all of those powers of the car are inconsequential when compared to the ma- the healing factor, I guess, of the car that it can completely fix itself. Any damage done, you know, it was a disguise when it was sitting out mm-hmm. there up on the cement blocks in that man's yard. Sure. Um, maybe it was a mutual conspiracy by that man in the car to get it to a new owner. Maybe the car was bored with that man, and so it made itself look really, really beat up to get it back out on the road, killing new people. The car has an inner desire to kill. Well, the car's jealous. That's the thing. Yeah. Is that the car just wants to be alone with Arnie. And... It wants an exciting new relationship. It's found one, and now it's jealous. Exactly. All right, so this scene, uh, it brings me a lot of pain, but it's also one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Stephen King very often as we talked about a little bit, makes stuff up as he goes. He is a writer who doesn't spend a lot of time outlining. He sits at a blank page and he types. And he continues to type, and he has said many a time that he does not have an ending written when he starts the book. And this is for a lot of his books. Maybe not universally true, but for a lot of what he writes. That's the method he prefers. And so that appeals once again to our sense of what we like about writers. Very clean, no editing, you have a nice polished manuscript, and you can read that. But it also explains why in a lot of these Stephen King movies and, I guess, books, if the books are anything like the movies, we have deus ex machina popping up out of nowhere. Yes. When the car can suddenly fix itself, even though we're only halfway through the movie, Uh probably not even at that point. Not quite, yeah. uh, It's hard to tell with the John Carpenter pacing where we are in the movie. But I almost feel cheat. I mean, am I justified in feeling a little cheated? Well, we watched Arnie repair the car and we watched the car repair Arnie for the first half of the film. Only to realize that Christine can do whatever she wants and right. that Arnie's kind of at her mercy no matter what happens. All right. So there's a couple of levels to this then. Uh, the first is that it just looks awesome. And a lot of times with us, that will trump what's actually yep. happening in the film. If it looks cool, it doesn't make a lot of sense. That's probably okay. Is that going to be a uh, a preview for Gojira next time? Yeah, pretty much. And I also like it because it's machines. It's physicality. It's less ghosts. Sure. This is still early when we're learning about the car. And it turns out the car can pop the dents out of its hood. It can reshine itself. It can repaint its whatever. So there's there's some physicality to that that I really like. But I also like this thing where it changes the role of Arnie in relationship to the car. It's no longer symbiotic. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that Arnie fixes the car. The car fixes Arnie. And it turns out that... You know, you had to believe that Arnie was this geeky kid who had a supreme love of cars, uh-huh. which I mean, when I bought my first brand new off the lot car, I did a lot of under the hood shit on it. And I, I don't know anything about cars, but uh, I, I guess I can understand that. But to think that he was able, it's pretty supernatural is what it is, the way he was able to fix up his car so much so that people in this movie will buy into ghost living car thing. But they will not believe. Everyone kind of says, man, you really fixed that car up nice. Surprise, surprise. How did that happen? And so when it turns out that the car can fix itself and it was just playing with Arnie, it becomes masturbation at that point. And it's way funnier to me that way. And it also gets Christine out of the realm of, you know, Spider-Man 3 just being a bad (laughs) remake of Christine. It's bizarre, the parallels between those two movies. Um, But he didn't earn it. He didn't earn it, and something about that justifies the scene, however weird ghost car fixing itself may be. So I, I was a little harsh earlier when I was knocking. I, keep, I kept saying the poor film, and I mean that lovingly because yeah. I adore the film. I absolutely love Christine and a lot of that. You can attest to this. I was defending John Carpenter for the first half of the film. Right. But I love the film, and I was just saying it's a poor film because it just got beaten so far oh, by, poor film. by the, the, the man behind it. Right. The king of subtlety. I'm not done with uh, awkward experiments on the show. I think we should just keep doing stuff where we don't know what the fuck we're talking about. Best way to do that is to get out of our country. Yeah, but we've snuck up on next week's films. Um, But we have a website, by the way, doublefeatureshow.com. We inadvertently hit all the bases inside the show. 
Uh, double feature show at gmail.com for those hot pictures of you naked with your favorite muscle car or just you naked would probably be i mean i wouldn't mind that Do no you that's fine that's that'll work and that's not just the fondas that goes for everybody in the audience if you'd like to donate to the show donate.doublefeatureshow.com would help us out a ton and if you're feeling cheap go on itunes and leave us a review so we have two movies as always or maybe as usual coming up on the show next time uh, we're kind of going back to the days of Black Dynamite and Hero, although those aren't the two movies. Right. We're going to do Fistful of Dollars and Gojira. Italy and Japan, right? Yeah. That's what's happening. Yep. Uh, so Italy, we know a little bit about. Sure. We've done some Italy. Haven't done a lot of Japan. No, we've done very little Japan. However, I've done very little of my Western homework, uh-huh. and uh, you have done all of your what what is the it's called kaiju We're i have call it no kaiju. idea i've what done we're... far too much kaiju homework not in my seen lifetime. one of these i have no idea what we're doing next you're time gonna on the love show. it i am already confused and frightened this is gonna be a great show watch more fucking film bye